Reformed Church. You know, it, it has been a really a, a very consistent thing. I was sharing different things with the Helps Ministry right before, um, right before service, but um, it has been a, a, a consistent thing in my heart when it has to do with correction. Um, and um, Hebrews ch chapter 12 is awesome. Um, it, you know, the Lord reminds us that if we are sons and that because we're sons, the Lord corrects us and that if the Lord doesn't correct you, then you're actually not a son at all, right? Because if you're, if you're not his, then he has no entrance into your mind, right? Just the same, the, the opposite scenario that when you are saved, the devil has no entrance into your mind, right? When you are saved, God has entrances into your mind and the devil doesn't. And on the flip side, when you're not saved, when you don't have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God doesn't have entrance in your mind. He has no, he, he, you're not made his habitation. You're not his, therefore he can't speak to your heart. Um, that should be something that Christians get used to and acknowledge that the Lord is your truth. And because he is your truth, he speaks to you, right? We, we don't, you know, the Lord, you know, showed the ignorance that there is in worshiping a god made out of wood right why because it's just an image it can't hear and it can't speak right it's deaf and it's dumb right but but he said that about himself that he's not right he's not a god that is deaf and not a god that's dumb right images and idols made out of wood and, and things that we would make with our hands and then worship as a god those are things that can't speak to you but that should remind us really that we we, we have a God that has made his habitation in us, and he speaks, right? He speaks just like I'm speaking, right? He speaks in a, in a much more powerful way, right, than even we exercise and comes out of us all the time, right? The Lord's able to speak with me and speak to you at the exact same time and, and not even us hear a word being uttered out here, right? He's able to speak directly into your heart. So we don't want to ever shortchange the Lord in thinking that speaking is what we're doing now, right? The Lord, the Lord is able to speak and he can speak in any language, right? And he's able to teach you things that are, that even when you're not even paying attention to him, the Lord can speak things into your heart and grab your attention. And, and so, so, you know, we, we have a God on the inside of us that definitely speaks to us. And because he's in us and he speaks to us, we have obviously have to know that, that in his speaking, he is correcting, right? Because when the Lord speaks something to you and he's speaking truth, and if you, and your thinking is contrary to that, right, when, you, when he speaks to you and you believe and you accept that truth, right, that is renewing your mind, right? In other words, the correction of the Lord is not something like he points out your, your bad thinking and makes you feel, you see what, how stupid that thought is? Here's a good thought, right? Like that, it's, he's not guilting you into seeing how horrible your thought is and then looking at his thoughts, how good they are, and then showing you the comparison. He, he speaks truth to you. And when, you, when, he, when the Lord speaks truth to you and you agree with that, right, that by just, just because of what you're doing, you're putting faith in what the Lord is saying, you're believing what he's saying, that's negating in your heart wrong thinking, wrong doctrine, right? And he, he does that without even pointing out the bad stuff that you, that you still have left up there, the, the foolish thoughts that are still up there. Um, just as we go through this uh, this evening, remember, you know, and th we're not going to go through it here, but the glossary is an awesome, um, just a really good uh, a resource that we have for you to be able to look things up. Um, and you'll hear something, uh, words like dog today, right? A dog is, is referred to as a foolish person, someone who needs correction with a staff, right? So that's not, not to be beaten with a staff, to be corrected with the staff, right? To straighten out your direction, to be, so that, that's a, a cool thing to look at. Um, and, and obviously we, we have mentioned several times bread in, in reference to life. I, I don't think that we're gonna go very much in depth in that, but that, that may come up. Um, so in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number one, um, we see, it says, it says, seeing that we're encompassed, and sorry, and this is Mr. Maris, this is uh, the AKJV, right, just in case. Um, it says, why seeing we also are, are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us let, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, which is continuance, 
the race that is set before us, and obviously that's speaking about faith, and that you do that by looking to Jesus, verse 2, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, right, despising the shame, and is set now down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 says, For consider him who endured such contradiction uh, of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds, right? That's an important thing, that when the Lord is... When the Lord's correcting your heart, he does that. And we were talking with, with, the, with the team earlier about, you know, having a heart that is prepared and ready to be able to, to deal with things that just happen in your day, right? Deal with unpleasant people, deal with rude people, deal with kind people, deal with people that compliment you because they want something from you, deal with people that compliment you because they, they sincerely mean what they're saying to you, right? So, but all of these things happen, but your heart doesn't have to be moved because you, you're not, you're not, you don't need to feel joyful when you're loved and sad when you're hated. You don't have to feel, you don't have to feel anything when people do things to you, right? You're not surprised by the reactions of people and you're not expecting the reactions of people, right? Your eyes are on the Lord. You're, you're, you're filled with the love of God. You're satisfied with the amount of love that you receive from the Lord, with what the Lord has done for you and what he's given to you. You feel, um, you feel content with everything that he that you already have from God, right? So you're not looking to you're not a needy person that is in need of attention and approval of people, right? So so your heart is just on the Lord, right? Um, but but what what he says here, he says he says when when things occur in your life, he says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. But there is something else also that causes us to faint in our heart or to become a bit disheartened, is that when sometimes, you know, you can be reading scripture or you can be praying and a thought comes to your mind. A thought that is just intended really just to speak truth to you. And remember, not to speak truth, to tell you what an ignorant individual you are for thinking what you did right it's that's not the way the lord corrects right uh, the lord is speaking a truth to you so that you will believe it now it may very well be completely contradicting something bad that you were just thinking like let's say you were putting yourself down you were feeling guilty you were all distraught about something that you did and the lord shows you truth about something he's not reminding you of that so that you recognize how bad it is what you've done all the contrary, what the Lord is doing, right? He's reminding you uh, of truth so that you can hear that truth, you can accept it, and you can rejoice in what Jesus has done. You can rejoice in the truth that Christ is to you, right? But sometimes the way we interpret the Lord bringing something up as truth when you've just did something wrong is you think what the Lord is doing is correcting your action. The Lord wants to correct your mind so you can live above what you just did, right? In other words, he, he's, he's not like necessarily just correcting the way you think so that you can feel down and distraught and then start beating yourself up. Yes, Lord, I'm not going to do that again. I see what I'm supposed to be doing because he's not telling you something so that you do something. He's telling you something because he wants your mind renewed so that you can live by the Spirit of God, right, and just put off the flesh, right, just by the fact that, not, not trying to put off the flesh, right, but just putting off the flesh because of the very reason that it's the Spirit operating in you, right? So the flesh is mortified or, or put to death, right, by the work of the Spirit in your life, right? So the Lord speaks truth to you, and your faith in it is all that he wants, right? He's speaking something. He doesn't want guilt. He doesn't want remembrance of what you just did. He just wants you to receive truth and say, you know what, Lord? I agree with that. That's awesome. That's good. That's, uh, that is in line with who I am, right? You're not trying to improve yourself. You're trying to agree with God that, yeah, that's, that's your thought, Lord, and that thought is in line with who I am already, right? So, uh, so no need, right, for us to be wearied in our minds by correction. The more, the, the better that, the more um, improved that your concept is or your believing is about how the Lord corrects you will get your mind to be able to know, Lord, all you're doing is reminding me of what's true. You're not trying to bring my attention to what I've done. You're just reminding me of what's true. And when I hear truth, I believe it. So when the Lord brings something up, just say, I believe that, Lord, that's true. I believe that, right? Whatever happened, who cares what happened? The Lord's not even bringing your attention to that. It's just, this is what will renew your mind so that tomorrow it'll be by the Spirit and not by the strength and power of men, right? Um, 
The Lord wants our hearts strong. The Lord wants our mind stayed, right? And, and that can only happen through correction. But we just have to understand how correction works with the Lord, right? Um, verse number four says, you have not yet resisted uh, to blood, uh, striving against sin like the Lord did. Verse number five says, and you, have, and, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to children. My son, this is the exhortation. My son, despise not, uh, despise not you the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. In other words, when, when the Lord corrects you by giving you truth, right? It says, don't, fe- don't be faint. Don't, don't think that what you're doing, Lord, is reminding me of what I've done. He's the very one that said that there is no condemnation as far as Christ is concerned with you, right? There's no such thing as God condemning you. That does not exist because he already condemned his son. So when the Lord is correcting you, he doesn't want you to be faint and he, don't, he doesn't want you to despise it. Right? In other words, to, to grow weary to the point where you don't like it. <laughs> like you would rather be around people that, are, that have done what you've done and can kind of just console you and make you feel like, like, like here's what you don't want. You, you don't want to get around people that do what you did and say, oh, don't beat yourself up about it. You know, I do it all the time. Like, that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> you don't want to feel consoled by someone telling you, don't worry because the same thing happens to me. No, no, no. This is not who I am, right? Whatever I've done 10 or 15 minutes ago, three days ago, whatever, right? Whatever happened in my past, I don't want somebody telling me, don't worry about it because everybody does it, right? Oh, don't worry about it. Everybody does that. No, no, no. I want to know. I want to think the thoughts of God. And that is the correction that I want for my soul because that's where rest comes from, right? I can't, I don't get any rest, right, from my actions by saying, don't worry about it because then that's just saying, just keep doing it. It doesn't matter, right? And then it's just still you doing it. What I, I want rest, I want to receive the rest that the Lord has given me by the Lord showing me truth, right? me agreeing and believing that having my mind renewed and let it be the spirit of god doing it while while i'm at rest right that that's that's what we really want so correction is an awesome thing the lord doesn't want you to despise it and he also doesn't want you to faint or be weary right is another way of saying that when you're corrected verse number six says for whom the lord loves he he chastens and whips which other other translations say scourges or whips which is the same thing there but again that's correction right and and there that that does seem when you're not used to correction and the lord bringing something up it's so easily misinterpreted that god is just that's where people get the thing about ah, i just feel the conviction of the holy spirit because they feel a sick feeling in their stomach when they've just done something wrong and, and, and a lot of times that sick feeling in your stomach is accompanied by the Lord speaking a truth. Oh, yeah, Pastor Jose, you were just reading my mail and I felt like somebody was beating me up. Well, that's the wrong feeling, <laughs> right? You shouldn't be feeling like somebody's beating you up, right, when you're hearing the gospel. If you're being reminded of the truth, just say, yes, Lord, I believe that. That's true. But the intention of the Lord bringing the truth to you is not so that you beat yourself up or so that you feel like somebody's beating you up, right? That, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't be the feeling, even though that's a very popular thing. People shouldn't feel like that when they're leaving church. People should feel like, I heard the truth, Pastor Jose, and I believe that. But not, oh, I heard what you said, and I feel like you were beating me up. Like, okay, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> so either I was saying something wrong or you were hearing wrong, but somebody's wrong, right? Somebody's wrong. Anyway, uh, so... Uh, in verse number six, he says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens or he corrects and scourges, corrects uh, every son whom he receives. So if you are really a son, that's the Lord, what the Lord wants you to do. He wants to renew your mind. And he does that by speaking the truth to you. Verse number eight says, um, no, sorry, seven. Seven, if you endure correction, and that is endure chastening, right? So the parable of the seed and the sower, you do hear that people, you know, they, they go away because they're chasing maybe the, the lust of this world, the care of this world, the lust for other things, whatever. But there are also many people who begin to believe, right, and hear truth. And just because you take the correction of God the wrong way, they're like, you know what, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to go back 
to living like when I didn't care about anything that I did and I just, it wasn't about seeking the Lord and it wasn't about feeling guilty and I'm just going to go do my own thing because they're misinterpreting correction. They think that what the Lord is doing is making them feel condemned for what they did. Showing them the truth, feel bad about what you did. Those are not, those two things don't go together. Believing what the Lord said and then feeling guilty about what you just did are not things that work together harmoniously, right? The Lord will correct what you're doing, quote-unquote, by just speaking truth to you. And the only reaction he wants from you is, yes, Lord, I believe that. Good. That's who I am. D don't, like, acknowledge that, that he's just telling you who you are already. He is speaking to you according to the mind that is yours. That old stuff that you have is an old man. They don't, don't try to mix the old man and the things that are, you're still feeling from that old thinking with who you are today. If you were in your right mind, quote unquote, you would believe, you would agree with everything that God says, right? And you would know all of the thoughts of God and you would agree 100% with them, right? Sometimes today, even though we agree with something that you hear, you still feel like the correction of God is to get you to look at that, right? But it's never that. The Lord never wants you, I believe that, Lord, and then look back at what you just did. That's not ever, the Lord never correlates the two things. Just you keep your eye on me and you agree with that and I'll take care of that. <laughs> but don't rubberneck looking that way, right? That's what they used to tell you in the Navy. Look forward. Look at, look at the head of the person in front of you, right? And don't rubberneck. That means don't do this, right? It's just right here. Just look at him. And, and it's a cool thing when you, when you allow the Lord to teach you just to keep your eyes on him, to come to me when you're weary and heavy laden and just keep your eyes on me. It's an awesome thing. You don't have to try to, like, sometimes people say, and this is stuff that they try to teach you, but, like, when you're preaching a message, just don't look at people. So, like, what the heck do I do? Look at the fans? Like, I don't know. Do I preach like this? Like this? Like, don't look at people because you don't look at their expressions. And, but it's not about that. It's that if I'm talking to you, but my heart is on the Lord, like, whether you look bored out of your skull or whether it looks like you're listening, it don't matter to me because it's not that I'm trying not to be moved by your expression. Is that... I'm just, I just got my eye on the Lord, right? So, so when the Spirit of God is doing something, it's not that, you, I was sharing this with the husband, it's not that you don't care what other people think to the extent that that's your, that's your thing. I don't care what other people think. It's not about feeling that way. It's that you won't care what other people think when it's just the Lord working through you. What is his doing? Like, what is there to care about? Oh, I didn't like what you just did. All right. Well, it wasn't me doing it anyway, so <laughs> this, is, this is the Lord doing it, and it's all good, and you know that it lines up with him. So if you, you agree with something that the Lord said, you agree with something that the Lord is doing through you, like what, what room is there to get someone else's opinion to see if they believe the same thing? It doesn't matter. It doesn't even enter into your thinking. So, it's, so again, it's just, just a different way of, um, a different way of like, guarding our hearts because your heart is guarded, just by keeping your mind on him. You don't have to like actively guard your heart. No, I'm not going to listen to what you're saying. I'm not going to listen to it, right? I mean, obviously, we don't have to just subject ourselves to listen to junk. You got a mute button if you're watching TV. But, but the thing is, right, the, the way these things happen, the mortification of the flesh, the, 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 the changing our actions, all that stuff, not feeling guilty, every, everything, all, those, all that stuff happens while you're just keeping your, your heart on the Lord, right? Correction then, which is where we're at tonight, when the Lord is correcting your heart, again, he's just speaking truth to you. And you can listen to it and say, yeah, Lord, that's exactly, that's exactly how I think. Imagine that. The way, what you're saying is exactly how I think, right? You have the same mind, right? We just need to get the church to have the same mind as the Lord. Because that is the mind that we all want to be of, right? It's not all churches agree and then wonder if we agree with God. It's that we all want to be of that mind, the mind of Christ that we have in us. That's the mind that we all want to agree with. All right. Um, so where are we at? We are, are we, did we read 7? Seven, seven, uh, let's do that again anyway. Uh, Hebrews 12, 7. If you endure chastening, or you, right, if you continue right, as the Lord corrects you, God is dealing with you as a son. That's, that's a, not a concept that you hear very popularly at the church. That correction is God dealing with you as a son. Like, I don't know what we think that that really means or if you ever thought about it. What does it mean when God deals with me as a son? Right? It's not, it's, it's, it's you being at his table, right? You being at his table and the Lord just speaking lovingly, speaking truth to you. 
Like that's an awesome thing, right? That's correction. <laughs> You're sitting at his table and the Lord loves you so much that he's speaking truth to you. That's all it is. It is nothing more and it is nothing less. And, and the correction is, I agree with that. I don't agree with the dumb thought I was having yesterday, but I agree with that, right? So just keep being mindful of that. You don't have to go back to thinking about anything else. Just I agree with that. Yes, Lord, that's true, right? Yes, Lord, that's true. So he's dealing with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Like what son is there that God doesn't correct? That meaning that God corrects every single one of us. Every single one of us the Lord is correcting, which means that he speaks to every single one of us, that he speaks truth to every single one of us. And if you're at a place where maybe you think, well, I don't know, really, honestly, when, when I hear you say about, like, like, the Lord brought up something to my heart, like, that's actually not a regular thing that happens to me. Normally, I just got to read the Bible, and then that's how I get what God tells me, right? But, but God is saying to you so that you know that by his spirit that lives on the inside of you, right, he speaks to every single one of his sons, he speaks truth. If you're his and he lives in you, he speaks to you. That's just a solid truth, solid truth. Um, for what son is he whom the father corrects not, right? What son is he, but, uh, uh, otherwise said, right? What son is there in, to whom I do not speak truth to, right? He speaks truth to every single one of us, every single one of us. Verse number eight says, but if you, if you be without ch chastisement, in other, if you be without correction, if you do, are one that doesn't and cannot hear truth whereof all of us are partakers i i love the fact that he keeps doing that right because it, it like it, it's ringing in my ears right whereof all are partakers in other words all of us are partakers of the fact that we hear from god he's speaking to you right we're all partakers of that then it says are you bastards and not sons that means you're without a father if the lord doesn't speak to you then you have no father now, and that's not to say, if you don't hear the Lord right now speaking to you, that means you are without a father. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if it is true to you that God does not speak to you and cannot speak to you, and you can't hear him, then you're not his, right? Because that's, those are the only people God can't speak to, are those that are not his. So any Christian who, who thinks, God cannot speak to me, right? I'm, I'm nothing but a dirty dog. The Lord, I'm a foolish person, right? The Lord can't speak to me because I'm a foolish individual. Then that means that you're not his, right? Like you, or, or either that or you have no idea who you are, right? So anyway, verse number nine, uh, it says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, meaning your earthly dad, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much, much rather be in subjection to the father of spirits and live, right? There are many, I mean, we live in a nation today. I, I, it's some kind of astounding uh, statistic about the amount of fatherless households that there are. It, it's staggering, right? But for a Christian that either grew up without a father or has no active father figure in their life right now or has a father that isn't a father to you, right? you are at no disadvantage whatsoever because, in other words, the temporary thing is kind of like you have a father, right, who you submitted to as an earthly father. But the truth is that if you are his, you have a father of your spirit. In other words, you are literally his and he is yours and even your very body is his and he is for your body, right? that loves and cares for you and wants to guide your mind. I mean, that's one of the most valuable pieces of having an earthly father, according to society, which there's a lot of truth to that, is that you have a father that's actually guiding your thoughts, can teach you about finances, can teach you about worth, work ethic, can teach you about responsibility, can teach you about, uh, about what it is to be married, to do all this stuff, just from a carnal perspective, obviously, we're talking, right? But all of these things you can learn from an earthly dad. From, from a perspective of a man, and you can hear the perspective of a woman, and the perspective of a mom and a dad make, make for a, a, a very, not a complete, I won't say from a carnal perspective, but a more rounded, right, family unit, right? It's intended to be that way. God intended to be that way. So, but, but you're not without any disadvantage because you have a father that speaks to you. So, so in other words, I get it. It may be 
difficult for you in your mind to understand right now that you're 18 years old and you have a father that's not in your life but if you if you acknowledge the father of your spirit if you're saved that speaks to you and is saying over and over again that you're a partaker of this right that this is for you you would see that you're you you actually have it better than you used to have it right better than you used to have it so you're not missing anything Right? It's, just, it's just a definite thing to acknowledge. Right, He is called the father of spirits. Again, in verse number 9, the latter part of that, the middle of it, shall we not much rather be in subjection, speaking of your mind, right? your mind subject to the father of spirits and live. That's an inevitable outcome of correction, life. If you allow, if you, the Lord speaks to you and you agree with it, the only thing that's going to come out of that on the other end is life to you. Life and peace, that's the only, that's an, inev- an inevitable thing. You don't have to have, even try to make it happen. If, if you listen to the Lord's correction, which is just him speaking truth to you, and you agree with it, life is on the other side of that. <laughs> that's all that there is. Nothing else can come of it. Nothing else can come of it. Only good can come of it. Only good. And that is life, right? It, verse number 10 says, For they truly for, uh, for a few days chastened us, meaning our earthly fathers, after their own pleasure, but he, for our prophet, the prophet is life, right? He, he, he speaks truth to you because he knows that it'll profit you. And all he wants you to do is say, Lord, I believe it. I believe it. I was just thinking the other day of the man that the Lord, you know, he actually bought his son who was demon-possessed and bought him to Jesus. And, 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 and he, he, he was struggling with faith. But he says, Lord, I believe, but it helped my unbelief. In other words, I believe you, but I got stupid thoughts still in my head. Help me with those, right? And he told them, all, all things are possible to him who believes, right? All things are possible. Because obviously, if the Lord speaks truth to you, which is unchanging, no one can change truth, right? So if the Lord speaks something to you that's truth and you believe it, who can change that? It, it's, life is activity, right? So when you hear something and you believe it, there's activity that follows that, right? So it's not just like life, in other words, like good stuff happened to you afterwards. It's that when the Lord speaks truth to you and you believe it, activity of the Spirit of God follows that. And that gives you rest and repose, right? The Lord is doing some stuff now. So he, it's a, if you want to know, well, how does the Spirit of God become active? Believe the truth. <laughs> when the Lord speaks truth to you, be like, yeah, I believe that. I believe that, and we have an enormous advantage here because obviously I think everyone that's here, right, we've all been together for a long time. The, the, the huge advantage that we have is that our hearts are very open to truth. I mean, I don't know that it gets better than that, <laughs> that you're so open to the truth of the Lord and that he speaks it and then you believe it. Like, I, I can't imagine a better scenario or a situation for you to be in, allowing the Lord to speak to you and then you believing it. <laughs> like, that is awesome. That is an awesome thing. You can't be in a better position than that. I can't think of a better position than that. Growing in the Lord constantly, the Lord is speaking to you and you believing it, that, that's magnificent. Awesome stuff. Um, it says, um, he for our prophet, that we might be partakers of his holiness, right? right? In other words, he's made us partakers of all that he is, right? Partakers of all that he's given us and all that we're doing is just hearing truth and agreeing with it, right? Hearing truth and believing it. Uh, now, no chastening, verse number 11, no chastening or no correction uh, for the present seems to be, not that it is, uh, but doesn't seem to be joyous, but grievous. It says, nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them which are exercised by it, right? So, obviously, the fruit of righteousness is life, right? The Spirit is life to you because of righteousness. So, the fruit of righteousness is life, right? Which is what he said above, right? Right? If you, when you subject yourself to the Father of spirits, when you subject yourself to the Father that is the same spirit that's in you, and you, he speaks to you and you believe it, life comes out the other side. Life comes out of the other side. Um, okay. Um, verse number 11, now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. We read that, sorry. People who are righteous to them that are exercised thereof. We, we just hadn't read the last little piece. To those that are exercised thereby, which is just saying to those that continue in it, right? Those that continue in that same thing. Verse number 12, this is important. I think this is going to tie into 2 Samuel. So if we can pay close attention to this. It says, it, says, it says, why lift up, it says, the hands which hang down. 
and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet that that which is lame that's important it just talked about hands hanging down knees that are feeble and feet that are lame right all of that is all is all uh significant of your mind right because we we know that feet right feet when the lord talks about how beautiful are the feet He's not talking about, you know, how beautiful the feet of those that bring the gospel. He's not talking about, like, how lovely are your toenails. He's talking about, like, how beautiful are the feet. In other words, your mind. What a beautiful mind you have, right, when you are of those that preach the gospel of peace, right? So what he's, what he's talking about, that when you preach and you herald the gospel, that's a beautiful mind, right? Like, you have beautiful thoughts, Think about those things that are beautiful and lovely of a good report, right? Um, so when, he, when he's talking about hand, hands which hang down and feeble knees, the, the fact that he's mentioning feet, I don't know right now in my mind the definition of hands and the definition of feeble knees, but I do know that he's talking about a weakness, and when he mentions lame feet, I know that that weakness is talking about my mind because there is nothing about my physical feet that's going to affect my faith. Nothing about my physical needs that's going to affect my faith. So there is only one thing that affects my faith and my believing, and that is my mind, right? As the Lord washes my feet, right, he wa he's washing my mind. So I, that, that whole thing about lame, lame feet, it, it, says, it says that make straight paths for your feet, right? In other words, that's keeping our heart on the Lord, keeping our eyes on Jesus we read earlier the author and finisher of our faith, is it lest that which is lame is turned out of the way. When your feet are turned out of the way, that means you're not, your eyes are not on the Lord. Now you're over here caring about people or you're over here caring about what you did or guilt or condemnation. That's your feet being moved. That which is lame, some translations say dislocated, right? In other words, like moved from lo one location to another, right? It's feet that are lame. In other words, you, you, you're not walking, right you're not walking if you will by the spirit right and in instead uh, we're mindful of left and right miss lindsay was singing about during praise and worship right not to the left or right for through you i'm justified i think that song goes um but it says that lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed right in other words that 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 which is lame is made well that a heart that is distraught by correction or problems or things that your heart can be renewed right healed made well um so let's go let's go to um you know what just real quick let's go to isaiah 35 verse number three isaiah 35 um this is where hebrews this is the the quote that hebrews where Hebrews 12 got it from. It says, strengthen the weak hands and confirm, it says, the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. So you see how it correlated weak hands, excuse me, weak hands and feeble knees to a fearful heart. And he's saying, be strong, fear not. So you know when he's talking about hands and feeble knees, again, it's an emphasis on the mind, on our heart, and not, that's why he's saying, um, he said to them that are of a fearful heart, uh, weak hands and feeble knees, fearful heart, right? Be strong and fear not. When, as Abraham grew strong in faith, Romans 4 talks about, that means his heart was growing stronger and stronger, even though he was seeing nothing and nothing, right? But his heart was growing stronger and stronger. So he, was, he wasn't moved by what he was seeing. Instead, he was moved by what he was hearing, right? His heart was moved to the gospel. He, it, what, his heart wasn't dislocated, right, to something else, to put attention on something else. Instead, his mind is just right on the Lord, right? Listening to the Lord, uh, rest. Um, it says, say, say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Verse number five says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, which is as a deer, right? Then, uh, then shall the lame man leap as a, uh, as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert, right? I remember that was like a, 
a, a thing I used, a devotional that used to be out there years ago called St Streams in the Desert. I wouldn't encourage you to read it. But, um, but it, 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 what he's talking about there is all of that um, about our heart and our mind, right? Not being, our heart not being dislocated. When it talks about feet that are lame, right? That's the reference there of a feet that need to be healed, a mind that needs to be renewed. And the only way it gets renewed is by us not growing faint when the Lord corrects you. That's why in that same Hebrews 12 correction, he brings this out of Isaiah 35, right? Because the, the, the hands that hang down, the feeble knees, the lame feet is all references to a heart that is fearful. And I tell you, I, I was just thinking about that. And I think that's a good thing. Good thing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that uh, anyone, Lord, right now would fear in their mind. Fear of men, fear of a future that they think may be controlled by the works of men. I thank you, Lord, that we, we have nothing to fear, Lord, that you, when you speak that to us about not having anything to fear, that you are speaking out of truth. When you tell us, Lord, you have nothing to fear, you're speaking truth. You're not giving us a circumstantial maybe. When you speak to us and you say you have nothing to fear, that is truth. The response that you want from us is to say, Lord, I believe what you say. That is truth, what you just said. I have nothing to fear. So I want to accept that truth, right? I want to accept that truth as, as, as not an opinion, not a, an opinion of a loving father, but the truth. I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. So thank you, Lord, that we would hear that today in our hearts, Lord, if there's any fear, Lord, over any situation, over any circumstance, right, any timidity in our minds, anything, Lord, that is holding us back, Lord, anything that's holding us back, Lord, whether it be the opinions of, of people, the, the things that they might say or not say, the acceptance of people or, not, or, or no acceptance of people, their rejection, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we have nothing to fear. When you say, Lord, that we, we do not have to fear, you're saying that to us, Lord, because that is truth. The only reaction you're looking for us, Lord, is just agreement with that, agreeing with a God that will never lie, agreeing with a God that will never lie. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, all right. Um, so verse 34, say to them whoever, or whoever are, are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with recompense, he will come and save you. Right? Obviously, that was talking futuristically. He has come and saved us, right? This is Isaiah prophesying about a Messiah to come. We're talking about a Messiah that came, right? So we don't have to fear because he has come and he has saved, right? Which is awesome. Faith either way works, though, but we have an advantage to the fact that it came and he made us new. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then, uh, verse number six, then the lame man, uh, then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing for the wilderness shall break out and streams in the desert. So that's all good. Let's go now to Second uh, Samuel chapter nine, right? Once you see some stuff, just pretty cool. Verse number one. Um, really, really, really cool before we get into this chapter, right? The, the name Jonathan, awesome. It means, the name Jonathan, if you have a, a Strong's, you could look it up, but it says Jehovah has given. That's awesome, right? Jonathan means Jehovah has given, especially when you're going to see the context of this. It's cool stuff, but Jehovah has given, right? When, uh, when in the New Testament, it uses the word kindness, right? Um, that can also be translated grace, right? The, the, the kindness of God that he has shown is all of the grace that he has provided through Jesus Christ, right? So, so just keep that in mind, though, right? Jonathan, it means Jehovah has given, right? So verse number one, it says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness, that I may show him the grace of God, and he confirms that, that what the kindness that he's talking about, even, even on, the, um, on the apparent level of Scripture, he's going to say, the grace I'm talking about is the grace of God, is what I want to show you. He's not just saying as a king, I want to be nice to you. No, he's saying, is there anyone of the family of Saul, 
any descendant of Saul, any physical descendant of Saul, he's saying that uh, is that because his concern is really not really Saul necessarily, but it's 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 uh, in the lineage even of Jonathan, right? Because he he made a covenant with Jonathan. So anyone who was an heir that came through there, right? He wanted to show kindness. But anyway, he is saying Saul. He says, "Is there is there yet any?" that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him the kindness or the grace of God for Jonathan's sake, for Jonathan's sake. So you translate that and says, for the sake of what Jehovah has given. What is it that Jehovah has given? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? The, what, what, what Jehovah has given is his son, right? What Jehovah has given is his son. So he's saying, is there anyone anyone that i can show the grace of god because of what jesus has done right the lord going to and fro across the earth to show himself mighty on the behalf right of someone that believes him right in other words like what 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 he's saying there is is there anyone that i can show the grace of god to that will believe what jehovah has provided right like if you can see that all, again all that he's saying is will somebody believe what i'm saying when I speak truth to a non-believer or a believer, will somebody believe what I'm saying? Jesus said, well, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? In other words, what he's saying is, will somebody believe what I say? If, if we know that God treats us as sons when he speaks to us, which means that he's always speaking to us, right? <laughs> so if God is speaking, will we believe what he say? what he says, so that he can, we can receive what Jehovah has given. What did we receive through the son that was given? Life. What does God, Jesus say that he came, that we might have life and life abundantly. What, what does he say about us reigning? That if you receive the abundance of the grace of God, which God gives to anyone that believes what he has given, right, through Jesus, right, anyone that believes in the son, right, of his love that he's given, He's, he's saying here, he, he says, he said that if you receive the abundance of the grace and of the gift of righteousness, right, you'll reign in life. Why? Because life is always the inevitable outcome of believing what God says, right? He, he says, is there anybody that I can show the grace of God to? Verse number two says, and there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. Uh, when, when, and when they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, uh, your servant is he. And, and, uh, and the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? So you know, he's, he's not talking about him being nice. He said, I want to show him the kindness of God. In other words, this, the only people that can show the kindness of God are people that have God working through them. <laughs> you can't show the kindness of God any other way, right? God can only work in the life of a person that believes him, Right? And so, or through a person that believes him. So David is saying, like, like, basically like Paul said, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. The only reason why he could say that is because he was confident in the fact that God works through me, and you gave me, and he's going to prosper you for my sake, right? But in actuality, right, it's not just for his sake. It's not just for Paul's sake, but it's for Christ's sake because there would be no consideration of Paul if it were not for Jesus' sake. So it is for your sake, but it is because you're his, right? So ultimately, it goes back to it being for Christ's sake. That's why he's saying, can I show the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake, right? Anyone, anyone that I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake, it, it's because of a covenant. God made a covenant with us. Therefore, right, you, he can show his kindness because of his, for Jesus' sake, because of the covenant that he's made with us. Um, so again, verse number three says that I may show the kindness of God to him. And Ziba said to the king, Jonathan has yet a son, watch now, which is lame on his feet. I, I was so drawn by the Lord to read this. And, and I, 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 even, I even said it out loud. I, I just laughed. I said, Lord, there is something so cool with being lame in your feet, and I don't know what it is. So, Lord, you got to tell me because I said, it's making me laugh. Like, I, I'm... I, when you read this, he keeps saying it over and over again. Like, like, wow, you're not just pointing out this man's handicap over and over and over and over again to me, right? Like you're saying he's lame in his feet. Did you hear that, Jose? He's lame in his feet, right? And he keeps saying he's lame in his feet. And I'm like, that's important. 
and I don't know why. <laughs> so I just, I just said, you know what, that's cool. Lord. I said, I know you'll tell me, right? So I'm just minding my business. I, said, I don't know. I think I was like building a set of steps or something at my house. <laughs> and it just, and, and I'm like, ah, oh, Hebrews chapter 12, lame in his feet, that your feet would not be dislocated. Your feet or your mind, like, oh, hello. Okay, so right? you, you could be just doing something, whatever. And he just interrupts you. And he says, hey, remember you asked me before? There it is, right? Anyway, so, uh, so this descendant of Jonathan is lame in his feet, right? So that means that he's foolish. He, he doesn't know the Lord. His thoughts are foolish thoughts. His, his ways are not God's ways. His thoughts are not God's thoughts, right? He, he needs to put away his own thinking and accept the thoughts of God. Obviously, that doesn't just have application, and we know it doesn't. It doesn't just have application to an unsaved person, right? We have now the mind of Christ, but you can just forget about your old thoughts, right? That's an old way of thinking. That's not how I think now. So that is correction, right? You hear the Lord speak truth, and you're like, yeah, that's truth. That means anything that's not that is a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true, and every thought in my brain that doesn't line up with that, let it be a lie. And done, right? Like, it's easy. You said it, that's a lie. <laughs> so you just keep going with it. You don't have to fight your lie, because I think that's where we get caught up sometimes. We, we, wanna, we got the truth, and then we want to go beat the snot out of the lie. You don't have to beat up the lie. Just keep believing the truth. <laughs> that's all. God's not asking you to fight with your lie. Just keep believing the truth. And by connection, right, you're putting to death the lie in your mind, right, Till the day that it's wiped out completely out of your brain, and all you have left is that truth, right? Keep looking at the truth. That's your bullseye. Keep looking at the truth. Keep listening to Jesus. Um, and, uh, and the king said, I think we're in verse 3, right? And the king said, uh, is there yet not any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet, right? So remember, he doesn't have a beautiful mind, right? He doesn't have a beautiful mind. Verse number four says, and the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house, watch this, he's in the house of Makir, the son of a male in Lodabar, Lodabar, that word Lodabar means where there is no pasture, where there is no pasture, right? You know how the Lord says that he makes us to lie down, speaking of your mind, that he makes you to lie down in green pasture, that he restores your soul. This man is said to live with lame feet in Lodabar, right? Which is where there is no pasture, right? That's interesting stuff. Verse number five says, so you, you get the picture, obviously. This is dealing with a person that's unsaved, and it has awesome application to us as well, right? What happens when you just keep your mind here on the mind that you have instead of some old thing? Verse number five says, then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Makir. That's pretty cool. He was fetched out, right? But anyway, he's fetched out of the house of Makir, uh, the son of Emiel, from Lodabar. So he's taken out of the place where there is no pasture, Right? So whenever anyone who is unsaved begins to listen to the Lord, they're already tasting of the goodness of God, right? They're already receiving, they're already receiving from the table of the master, right? They're receiving from the table of the Lord, right? Uh, bread, they're receiving from him. And, and they're just, they're not even established yet in their faith. And they're already tasting of the power of the age to come. They're going to begin experiencing life in the, right away. And all they've done is just started listening to the Lord and believing what he's saying, right? Growing in their faith, yet not completely established yet, but still enjoying the benefits of it. Thank God God doesn't jip people, right? Anybody who starts believing begins to see the effects of that right away in their mind, in their thinking, in their life, in their body. Uh, verse number six. Now, uh, when Mephibosheth, which was the name of the, of the son, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David... Watch this, he falls on his face, and he did the king, David, reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold your servant. Verse number 9 says, And David said to him, watch, fear not. That's the very thing, that's also not a mistake, right? And I didn't see that until now. The Lord, we were just praying a second ago about fear, right? And that when the Lord tells you, don't fear, he says, he is saying to you as truth, because there is nothing for you to fear, and, and he, that's the first thing that David says to him is, fear not, right? Because he's saying to him, not, you're, you're under the care of the king. There is no one in this kingdom for you to fear. 
No one in this world for you to fear. You're under my care, right? We, we should understand whose we are, right? We are his. We're not just some lowly Christian walking aimlessly around the world. We're his, right? You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear, right? You, you, don't, you don't have anything to fear, and not even fear itself do you have to fear, right? You have nothing to fear, nothing. Fear not, for I will surely show you the kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. I will surely show you kindness for the sake of the one that God has given, which is Jesus, right? The one that God has given is Jesus, which is what the name Jonathan means, right? So he's saying, I will surely show you my grace because you have believed in the one that I have given, Christ, right? When you believe what the, in the one that God has given, you receive of the grace of God, right? You become a partaker of that, right? That's correction, right? When the Lord corrects your mind, you believe it, you receive. You, it, it's such an awesome thing. That's why a wise person loves correction, right? Why does a wise person love correction? Because you know what's inevitably on the other side of that. First of all, it's true, and you're not a liar. That's awesome, right? The second thing is, the only thing on the other side of this for me is life. So it's win-win regardless, right? It's never a losing proposition. Now, if you compare believing the truth to, oh, my old friends don't like me, well, you just got to choose what's better to you, what your old friends say or what God is saying. And if you weigh out and side with your friends, well, then you just did. <laughs> but I wouldn't. I would never do that, right? Don't side with the world. I side with the truth. Always side with truth. Always. I will show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore, listen to this awesome stuff, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. That's forever. Eating bread forever, you know what bread means? Life. You know what forever means? Eternal. You know what that means? Life eternal. Life eternal. When you believe me, you get what? Life everlasting. You live forever, right? You have, I mean, that, that is an awesome thing. You, you eat bread at my table continually. That's the life of God that you're talking about. It's not some good experience in living. It's the life of God that's working in and through you, right? It's the power of God to prosper you and everything. That's, that's the table at which you sit. That's what you get, have an opportunity to eat of without Money without price, just eating, right? Just eating. What, what has he done to earn a place at that table? Nothing. Nothing. It's just his father. That's all that he did was just look at his father, right? And it was for Jonathan's sake that everything was being done for this man. Everything. Just for Jonathan's sake, right? Everything that we have is all just for Jesus' sake because of what the Father has given, who is Christ, right? That's the only reason why we have it all, and it's a good enough reason. That's a good enough reason. You shall eat bread at my table continually, right? Eat bread at my table continually. But, but he says in, in the latter part, in the beginning part of verse number seven, I just love that again, you got to read it. And David said to him, fear not, right? I'm telling you, if there is fear in your mind about the future, about your present, about something you heard, about something someone told you, the Lord is telling you, uh, he's saying it again, right? There is nothing at all to fear. The very thing you're thinking about is not something you need to fear. It's not, right? It's not something you need to fear. Thank, thank you, Jesus. For I will surely, that's a guarantee, that when God says surely, that's an ironclad thing. Surely I will show you my grace for Jesus' sake. Surely I will show you my grace for Jesus' sake, right? You'll see it. The manifestation will come. Just you believe it. That's all you have to do. You don't got to make it come. You don't got to work it out with a crank. Just you believe it, and inevitably it will come. Inevitably, right? You'll eat bread, life, right? You'll receive life continually, life everlasting. Look at verse number 8. And he bowed himself. Watch what he says about himself. He bowed himself and he says, what is your servant that you should look on such a dead dog? What, who am I that you should look upon a foolish person as me, right? A dog, a foolish person that needs correction. So there is nothing wrong with what he has said about himself, right? What he's saying is 1 John 1, 1 right? Where he says, if you don't say that you have sin, right? 
that you need the Lord and you don't acknowledge that you have sin, you can never be saved. But if you acknowledge, Lord, I am a sinner and I need to be saved. In other words, I'm a dead dog. I'm a foolish individual that needs all of my thinking wiped out. I have to despise my thoughts, Isaiah says, right? Let the, let the foolish man, right? Let, let the ungodly person, let that man despise his thoughts, right? That, that's what Zib is doing here. He's saying, what, who am I that you should look at me, a dead dog? But the thing is, it's not for your sake, it's for his, right? It's because of Christ's sake that you're receiving everything, right? It's because of Christ. Now watch, he says, uh, he bowed himself, verse number eight, and he said, what is your servant that you should look on such a dead dog as I am, right? Uh, in verse number nine, then the king called to Ziba, which was a servant. Watch what he says. Check this out. We're wrapping up here. The king says to Ziba, who was the man that went to go get the boy, right? That was lame. Saw a servant. He, he's a servant. And he says to him, I have given to your master's son all that pertained to your master, Saul. I've given it to him, all of it, right? Guess who goes with the everything? He does, Ziba. Because he's a servant of that house. So he's telling him, watch for a reason. I have given to your master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, he's talking to the servant. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants, listen, listen, <laughs> shall till the land for him. You will till the land for him. And you shall, and you shall bring in the fruits. In other words, you're going to bring in the harvest. For him, that your master son, him, <laughs> right, may have food to eat. Here's why that's so important. He, <laughs> can, we, can you go real quick? We'll stay here. Can you turn us to John 4.34 real quick? Right? He's, he's saying to him, he's saying to him, everything that is Christ is his for Christ's sake. Everything that is Jonathan's and Saul's, in other words, what Jonathan had was by inheritance of Saul. Therefore, he's looking at the descendancy of the father, the son, get it? The father, the son, right? And the Holy Ghost in us, right? The Spirit of God in us. Everything that is the father's is the son's, and he said, now it's his. Everything that is the father's is the son's, and now it's his, right? And, and he's saying here, right? He's saying here, in, in verse uh, 34, Jesus said to them, my meat or my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Yep, go to the next verse. Say, uh, say not you, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. In other words, he's saying, don't say that it's coming. It's today is the day. Today is the day, he's saying, of harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the field. Lift up your eyes, right? He, he, again, just another reference to your heart. Lift up your eyes, for they are white already to harvest. In other words, today is the day. Keep going to the next one. And he that reaps, right? M Mephibosheth was reaping, right? R was reaping. And, and he could not work, right? He, he, he was reaping and he could not work. And he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit. What was it that he said here? He, he said, and he shall bring in the fruits. And he shall bring in the fruits that your master's sons may have food to eat. In other words, bring in the fruit for him. Bring in the fruit for him. He says, and both, he says, uh, receives wages and gathers fruit to life eternal. That's the same thing he was saying before, right? Bread continually, life eternal. Mephibosheth would, would receive bread continually, life eternal, that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. Go ahead to the next one. And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. Yep, keep going. I sent you, watch now, I sent you to reap th that whereon you bestowed no labor, other men, servants, Ziba, his sons, and his servants, they have labored. They're the ones that'll work the field. They're the ones that'll bring in the harvest. All that this man's gonna do is just sit there and receive it all. He doesn't go to the field. He doesn't work the field. He doesn't go out there and pluck an apple. He sits where he is, and he gets it all. He doesn't work. He doesn't labor. He just rests there and receives it all. All he does is get what is his, his father and his grandfather's, right? 
That's all that he gets. What is, whatever is of the Father and is of the Son is now his, right? Same exact thing we have, right? He says, no, um, I, sh- I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men, and that men is definitely an added word. It just means another has labored or others have labored. Either way, it's the Father and the Son, or you can look at it as just another, Jesus, but it's definitely talking about their labor, right? And you are entered into their labors. That is an awesome thing to remember. I enter into the labor of Jesus. In other words, for his sake, I'm entering into, I have entered into his labor, right? I'm, I'm reaping where I have not sown. Let, let, let's, let's bring you back again to 2 Samuel 9. Verse number 10, you therefore, no, sorry, verse number 9, 2 Samuel 9, 9. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servants, and said to him, I have given to your master's sons all that pertain to Saul and all of his house. I've given him everything. I've made him an heir and a joint heir with Saul and Jonathan, right? At this point, even though he was an heir, he had nothing. David made it so he had everything. Not some of it, all of it, (laughs) all of it. You therefore... Are, um, verse 10, you therefore and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and you shall bring in the fruits that your master's sons may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. You see, stuff like that is not a mistake, right? Because he's not saying, he didn't say, and, and Mephibosheth will have always to eat from the fruit that you bring in. That's not what he said, Right? Like, that's not an accident why he words it like that. Because he says to him, he says, you'll bring in fruit so that he'll ho- always have food to eat, right? But then he says, because he will always eat continually at my table, right? Like, that's a really cool thing to remember, right? That, that you have bread always. Even the woman that had, the, woman that had uh, the daughter that was demon-possessed severely, she comes to Jesus and she said, Lord, and she's crying out to him. And, and the disciples said, tell her to go away, right? She's just annoying us, right? She's bothering you. And then she keeps crying out. And Jesus said, he said, it's not right. Like, he knows what she wants. He knows that it's her daughter that's ill, right? And, and he says to her, it's not right for me to take the children's bread, right? To take from what is, belongs to the sons, those that sit at the master's table, right? It's not right for me to take what is of for the sons and give it to you who are not a son. But then and when she says, even the dogs, right? The foolish ones, the ones that don't think right yet, right? Uh, eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, right? What she is showing is she's believing, all that she's demonstrating in her going after him and her seeking him is that she believes him, Right? So when people begin to believe in the Lord, even though they're not saved, they receive what? They taste of the power of the age to come. The the girl was healed, right? The girl was healed. So it's it's the same bread, the same life, right, that that he's saying here, Mephibosheth will, will sit at my table and eat bread always. Words like always, when you see that in Scripture, it's an awesome thing because it, it gives you the connotation of something that never ends, even though physically, obviously, that boy didn't always eat at the table because if they're both dead, there goes the always, right? But, but the, the, the point of that is, is eternity, right? That, you know, when it long, elongates things like that, it's talking, making a reference to eternity. So, so he says, he said, but Mephibosheth, your master's son shall eat bread always at my table. Um, a, a, anyway, but... Um, he, he, it says then that now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So that man overnight inherits 15, right, 20. So 35 servants overnight he gets. Can't work, but has 35 servants doing everything for him, right? Awesome stuff. Uh, in verse number 11, then Ziba, uh, then said Ziba to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so shall your servant do. And as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. You see that reference there? The, the ones that eat at the table are sons. Those, those are the people that are allowed to take, eat of the bread of the table. Sons, right? Sons. Uh, 
And he says, and Mephibosheth, verse number 12, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was uh, Micah, I think that's pronounced, and all that dwelled in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. Look at verse number 13. It's the last verse there, but it's really cool. It says, so Mephibosheth dwelled in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually, life everlasting, right, at the king's table, and look how it ends, and was lame on both his feet. And you would think, well, that's a heck of a way to end the nice story, right? And, and by the way, he was lame again. Like you said it before, you're saying it again. He's lame on, his, on both his feet. But, but what is that, right? That, in other words, that, that just shows the, the foolishness, right, of thinking that needs to be corrected, right? And, and whether it be for a person getting saved, right, that has feet that are lame and all of their thoughts are foolish, versus an, uh, a saved person that it has a mind that's being renewed but still has foolish thoughts in them. I mean, obviously, the Lord would never call you foolish, right? But we still have thoughts that are of the old man, and the old man is definitely a fool, right? So we still have foolish thoughts of a fool that is not you anymore, right? But it's left over in your head. But So the Lord definitely wants to renew that. It, the cool thing is he does that by correction, speaking truth to you so that you will believe it and agree with it, right? The awesome thing is at the end of that is just life, and it's life everlasting, right? Life everlasting. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Let's pray real quick. Thank you, my God. We just thank you, Lord, for all of the things, Father, that you continually remind us of, and we do not despise your voice. We don't push aside your emphasis lord so when we hear you say things like fear not when we hear you bring truths like that up when we hear you bring truths up into our hearts lord like like you speak to us lord and you're never reminding us lord of and not trying to bring guilt or condemnation lord for past faults or for thoughts that we have had but that you're just bringing up truth lord in order that we would agree and be reminded of who we are and what we have Lord, we thank you, my God, that um, we know, Lord, that we sit at your table and that the words that you speak, Lord, that we are guaranteed that because we are sons, you're speaking to us, Lord, speaking to us. Let us believe, let us believe and understand and grow established in the truth that God is always, always speaking to me and that all that I have to do is incline your ear to me, the Lord said, right? incline your ear to me not to your neighbor not to your circumstance not to other people not to thoughts running wild about what other people have done and what you've done in the past and what you're feeling and what's going to happen next and i'm feeling this pain so that means this when you allow the symptoms in your body and the things going on in your mind to dictate what happens next you have forgotten about the god that speaks truth and will tell you what will happen next, the life that will come next. That is what will always come next when you just believe in truth. Life, the fruit of righteousness, is what will come next. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, reigning in life is where we're going. Reigning in life. Reigning in life with you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you. We love you. We believe it. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this uncommon truth out to the world. If you'd like to support this good news, you can do so at reformchurch.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reformchurch.com.